thank you very much for this opportunity to talk again. Uh, thanks to the horrors of a tiny little virus, too small to see by the human eye. Uh, we're in isolation on different parts of the world, in different parts of the world, but modern technology means we can communicate remarkably. I want to begin by saying I've been really struck by the way in which you saw what was coming ahead of many other people that we would normally have expected to have been warning us and preparing us. And right through it, this whole episode, uh, you've been unpacking it brilliantly in a way that means that we ought to be paying a lot more attention to you, if I can put it this way, than some of the people, frankly, that we might have expected to have done a better job on leading us through. So thank you very much indeed. But um, can I begin by focusing a bit on just how blind we seem to have been to a lot of what was coming. And it was you who alerted me to the reality that um, between January the 21st and 24th of this year, the World Economic Forum in Switzerland should have been, I would have thought, very much focused on what was going to be, should have been very obviously coming straight at us, this pandemic, and yet it was completely focused, as I understand it, uh, on climate change. There were even representatives there from Wuhan province in China. But what came out of it? What does it say about the way in which somehow or other we get this mob spirit, uh, this herd mentality that blinds us to the real and present issues? Well, John, I, I was at the World Economic Forum uh, back in January, and it was a slightly surreal occasion uh, for me because the only topic of conversation seemed to be climate change. Greta Thunberg was there to be fated, uh, Donald Trump to be jeered at. The uh, global risk report that the World Economic Forum publishes annually had as its uh, top four risks various aspects of climate change. And I felt like a lone voice saying at the various meetings I attended, we really ought to be much more worried uh, about the impending pandemic that is, is coming from, uh, from Wuhan. And, uh, and why are we not talking about that? And I got some funny looks from people who obviously thought I'd uh, become even more eccentric than usual. But I'd been in Asia at the beginning of January. In fact, I was in Hong Kong, Taipei, and then in Singapore and heard then about what was going on in, in Wuhan. As an historian, I'm not an epidemiologist, I hasten to stress, as an historian, I've always been fascinated by pandemics because they are these hugely disruptive events that come along in, in history. And I'd studied the 1918-19 influenza pandemic when I was a much younger man working on the First World War. It's probably one of the reasons that the war ended in 1918. I remember delving into German uh, military statistics uh, and finding that there's this huge increase in the number of soldiers reporting ill in mid-1918. And uh, that correlates pretty closely with the collapse of the German army on the Western Front as, uh, as British and, of course, Australian and Canadian and New Zealand soldiers uh, inflicted decisive defeats. So I hypothesized in my book, The Pity of War, that the Spanish influenza, as it was known, uh, was one reason the war came to an end. So I've been interested in this uh, for more than 20 years. In my most recent book, The Square and the Tar, I made an argument that we'd created a perfectly networked world, not only digitally, but uh, physically, thanks to our extraordinary network of air travel. And this perfectly networked world was a sitting duck for a virus like uh, the coronavirus that came from Wuhan. So it was odd really to be uh, at Davos and find so few people paying attention to it. Frankly, it was still the case when I was in Washington roughly a month later that people were paying too little attention and I practically had to physically corner uh, members of the administration to impress upon them that this was not going to be your seasonal influenza and that a major problem was coming that would have huge economic ramifications. And, and so it hasn't been easy because in my weekly columns and in various interviews, uh, since around January the, the 20th, I've been, I've been talking about this. It wasn't really until mid-March that the message got through 
And then governments in Washington and in London went from insouciance to, to panic. And I think we ended up in a situation that uh, we've gone from one extreme to the other. Uh, we've ended up with measures that I, I regard as, as overkill. And I think we've ended up, at least in, in Britain and the United States, with the worst of both worlds. Uh, we've, we've not done enough to stop uh, the virus spreading across our countries, but we have done enough to crater our economies. And that seems like a terrible policy outcome for what were supposed to be well-prepared nations. I think that uh, raises the very interesting point that, again, I think you've revealed that both Britain and the US had identified a pandemic as the number one threat, frankly, ahead of even terrorism uh, to uh, uh, the social and economic fabric of their respective nations. Both claim to be very well prepared. In fact, a major paper had been um, put forward in the United States uh, only 18 months or so before this emerged, uh, setting out how America was ready to respond. And as you put it, on paper, both nations were claiming not only to recognise how dangerous a pandemic would be, but that they were ready for it. In reality, neither proved to be true. So this comes again to this issue of the hard questions that need to be asked. What went wrong? I think there's been a certain amount of... Uh red herring consumption in the media about this. The um, focus in the US is almost always on President Trump. And uh, that leads to a, a, a constant debate about whether he uh, was too slow to recognize uh, the risk, whether he's bungled the crisis. And we have the same debate in the UK about Boris Johnson, who of course, in fact, uh, was taken very ill with uh, with uh, COVID-19. I don't think that the real issue is what happened at the top. Actually, if you look at, at Trump, he at least realized that he had to do something about uh, flights from China in late January. It was too late by then, but at least he saw that there was a problem. And he was criticized at that time by the Washington Post. Uh, at that point, the liberal media were crying uh, uh, foul and accusing Trump of overreacting. That's all now forgotten because the narratives become that he, he was too slow. I actually think Trump made multiple mistakes, uh, uh, including playing down the, the virus on a number of occasions as just influenza, but that's not really the, the key point. The key point is that uh, both the United States and the United Kingdom had on paper uh, rather well-crafted plans for dealing with a pandemic. Uh, there are uh, agencies, in the case of the United States, it's the Department of Health and Human Services, whose sole job is uh, biodefense. There's uh, an undersecretary uh, who really has that as, as his sole responsibility. Uh, in 2018, the, uh, the undersecretary in question uh, even gave a lecture on the subject, warning that if there wasn't a sufficient insurance policy in place, the US would be SOL in the event of a pandemic. I didn't know what SOL meant because I was never in the US Army. It's short for shit out of luck. Uh, now, for the undersecretary responsible for biodefense to say that, a month after the administration publishes a 36-page plan for preparedness in the event of a pandemic is kind of strange. And it's even more strange when you find that the following year, in 2019, i.e. last year, Congress passed uh, an entire act with respect uh, to biodefense. Uh, on paper, the United States was well prepared for this. Uh, the bureaucracy had a plan, it had people, uh, and it had resources. Uh, so something went terribly wrong with the administrative state, with the federal bureaucracy. Uh, when it came to the crunch, none of the things written down in multiple PowerPoint presentations worked. And in fact, the US turned out to be completely incapable of the most important thing that you need to do early in, uh, in an epidemic, which is to have lots of testing in place so that you can identify who's infected and then 
isolate them. That's what Taiwan did. That's what South Korea did. That's what most well-prepared uh, Asian democracies were able to do. Uh, the United States completely flunked it and has only just in the last week caught up with South Korea with respect to testing uh, per capita. So that's a shocking performance of a bureaucracy that was supposed to be ready. And I could tell a somewhat similar story for the UK. There will have to be a proper inquiry into what went wrong, just as after the 9-11 attacks in 2001, there was a commission that, that looked into why it was that uh, all the warning signs had been, had been missed. I think this is actually a worse case because a terrorist attack like that of 9-11 uh, was, I think, a lot harder to predict than a pandemic uh, arising from uh, an East Asian coronavirus. That, that was a highly likely scenario. And indeed, numerous people had been warning about it for years. I mean, you can go back and look at TED Talks, not just by Bill Gates, but by the epidemiologist Larry Brilliant. You can find discussions of this topic by numerous public intellectuals. Nassim Taleb, for example, uh, often talks about this as the number one risk. So this was not exactly a black swan. It was a grey rhino that you just knew at some point was going to come charging towards you. And I still don't really understand why the state, uh, which was on paper so well prepared, completely flunked the test. It's important, of course, to try and get as good a handle on uh, uh how you debate your way through these things, because coming out of this, there'll be any number of difficult decisions to be made. So this question of how we understand it seems to me to be very important. You would, I think, say, and I would agree with you, that if you want to understand the future, you need to understand the past. It seems to me almost impossible to think of a, a time, though, when right across the world, Countries have deliberately closed down their economies and then put them on life support to try and keep the beast alive while it's in hibernation. Is there any precedent that you can think of for, that, that might help us understand a little how to manage that part of the process? There isn't an exact parallel because in, in previous pandemics, it was never thought necessary to shut down the economy. Uh, in 1918-19, uh, although there was huge disruption and excess mortality, and although social distancing measures were introduced, school closures and so forth, uh, there really wasn't an interruption of economic life uh, of this sort. In 1957-58, which by the way is a much better analogy because COVID-19 is not as dangerous as the 1918-19 influenza, no way. Uh, it is much more like the 1957-58 influenza in terms of its likely infection fatality rate. And if you look back at 1957-58, the United States government did not do anything like this. On the contrary, uh, life went on without any federal or indeed state orders uh, to close uh, businesses and, and factories. There was minimal social distancing. Yes, there was excess mortality, but the Eisenhower administration thought that its priority should be uh, to expedite research on vaccination and get a vaccine ready as soon as possible. And it requested the startlingly small sum of $2.5 million from Congress to accelerate vaccine research. The contrast between that response and our response is absolutely extraordinary. The only analogy that I can really come up with is that in 1914, when World War I broke out, it was a huge surprise to most people. And it caused a huge economic uh, crisis across the world. In response to which, the authorities uh, in most of the major economies shut down the stock markets uh, because they did not want trading to continue as it would, of course, have revealed uh, a disastrous sell-off causing not just liquidity but solvency problems. So we had a period in late 1914 when all the major stock markets were closed and they didn't really reopen until the end of that year. During that time, particularly August, September 1914, there was an enormous economic dislocation, not because anybody ordered factories to be closed, but just because panic swept uh, around the world. And uh, in the absence of of open stock markets and in conditions of great uncertainty, a lot of businesses did shut down. Uh, 
Uh, but there's a big difference between a pandemic and a war. A war solves its own economic problem by enlisting uh, over time the able-bodied men, placing orders for munitions uh, from the major industrial concerns. And so by 1915, the unemployment that had featured in the immediate aftermath of the outbreak of war was gone. A pandemic's not like that. Uh, there isn't the same demand uh, for employment uh, or manufacturing. Sure, we need vaccines, we need testing, but that's not going to create the kind of jobs that are desperately needed now. In any case, what we've done was more than just uh, a panic. We, we had a state-mandated economic lockdown in some of the most important economies in the world, New York State and California State in particular. And I think that future historians will say this was a mistake, that we thought we had to copy the Chinese uh, in what they had done in Hubei, which was to shut down the entire province, lock down the economy, and lock people in their apartments. I think we drew completely the wrong lesson from Asia because we were looking at the wrong China. If we'd looked at Taiwan, we'd have seen that the correct response to this kind of a pandemic is to ramp up testing and contact tracing and leverage uh, not only uh, the traditional mechanisms of social distancing that are appropriate in a, a pandemic, but the new methods that technology make possible, like digital contact tracing. We didn't do that. We failed completely to learn from the Taiwanese or indeed the South Korean example. And I think we could have achieved the containment of the virus through those methods at a far lower cost than we are now paying for having essentially closed down economic activity uh, in an indiscriminate way. Moreover, just to add one final point, we've sought to offset the shock that we've imposed on ourselves with unprecedented, at least in peacetime, monetary and, and fiscal measures. And while you could argue that they were uh, a reasonable thing to do uh, for a short-term shutdown, I don't think we are actually in a position to do this just for the short term, because I don't think we're going to get a V-shaped recovery that will allow us uh, rapidly to normalize monetary and fiscal policy. And so I think we've created a whole boatload of problems for the future by allowing uh, all monetary and fiscal discipline to be thrown out the window. This phrase, whatever it takes, has become a cover for extraordinarily reckless measures, which will have many unintended consequences. So I actually give us low grades, both for the supply side shock, which didn't need to be this big, and for the compensating monetary and fiscal measures, which I'm sure will have unintended negative consequences. It's really a pretty shocking combination when you think about it. And what makes me angry is that it didn't need to be this way. Because if we really paid attention to how to handle a pandemic smartly, uh, if we'd learned from Taiwan, South Korea, if we'd had the right uh, procedures in place rather than the ones that failed, then we wouldn't really have needed to do the lockdown. There's been no lockdown in Taiwan at any point. And they have a minimal number of cases and a minimal number of deaths. And guess what? They're right next to the People's Republic of China. They were as exposed as anybody to the risk. So our failure to come anywhere close to that kind of performance is, is deeply, deeply disturbing to me. I can only say I agree with you, and I'm very concerned. I, I, I would have to say I think the Australian government has handled this quite well to this point in, day, uh, to this point in time, uh, and they've had uh, good recognition of that in the polls, and the numbers are very encouraging on the health side of the equation. But how we handle it from now on is going to be critically important because of the potential to do permanent damage at great cost, particularly to coming generations and their interests. Now, we've just seen in Australia... Something that is deeply disturbing to me, uh, about 250, many of them very well-known economists, sign a letter, open letter to the government, um, keep the foot on the brake. Um, uh, there's no balance to be taken into account here. You've just got to do everything you can to preserve lives. Don't start to ease the lockdown too early. There's no analysis. There's no argument. It sounds vastly more like a political statement 
than a carefully thought through economic and social analysis of the realities that confront us as a nation. And it's been absolutely smashed by two or three of our leading economists. But it raises the point that it's very easy to be political, very easy to be emotional, very hard, uh, hard to be clear-headed and thoughtful and realistic. And yet my observation, not that you can move around much at the moment, is that people in the street are often much more pragmatic, Neil, now than our technocrats, the people who set themselves up as experts. And it makes it very hard for politicians in an age when they don't often enjoy the level of respect that they need to be able to carry us when difficult difficult decisions have to be made. Well, I'm going to tread warily on uh, the Australian uh, material simply because I'm a long, long way from, from Australia. You're right there and I haven't read the, the Economist's letter. But let me just offer some contextualizing statistics. If you just look at fatalities per million people, since this pandemic began. Uh, the UK is on 255, uh, the US is on 136, Canada's on 48, and Australia, 2.9. So the UK has two orders of magnitude more fatalities in relative terms than Australia. New Zealand has exactly the same statistic, 2.9. Something has gone very right in the Antipodes by comparison with the rest of the English-speaking world. And it's worth pondering what that is, given that uh, Australia doesn't look less connected to Hubei province uh, than the United States. Uh, so I think, first of all, credit where it's due, uh, both Australia and New Zealand have, have handled this a great deal better. Secondly, with that in mind, it's clearly much more plausible that Australia should be considering uh, a phased return to work in the same way that Germany is. Germany's been one of those European countries that's handled this relatively well and uh, can now consider and is indeed now implementing a phased return to work. What are the prerequisites for that? I think it's all about having adequate testing capacity and contact tracing capacity because you are going to be playing whack-a-mole with this virus uh, for months to come, there isn't going to be a vaccine until next year at the earliest. And, and we shouldn't be over optimistic about what a vaccine can do against a coronavirus like this, or indeed what kind of immunity you're going to have uh, with such a vaccine. Uh, that means that as we return to work and indeed return to education, it's highly likely that there will be second waves and maybe third waves. Look at Singapore, which thought it had things under control and then noticed to its horror that its, its uh, foreign workers in their pretty cramped hostels were in fact uh, infested with uh, the virus. I, I think every country is going to be playing uh, this complex, uh, difficult game of trying to return to economic normality without letting uh, the virus uh, return uh, in force to the population. And I don't think anybody should be contemplating returns to normality, to work, uh, until they have the right kind of uh, testing and, and contact tracing capabilities in place. And even then, it's going to be difficult. Finally, a critical variable here, which distinguishes this pandemic from other pandemics, is that it disproportionately kills the elderly. Yeah. The influenzas that swept the world in 1918, 19, and 1957, 58, and indeed in 1968, were altogether less discriminating. They killed kids uh, as much as they killed seniors. Uh, we should actually be pretty thankful that COVID-19 uh, goes after people who are uh, at the latest stage of life and doesn't kill uh, uh, kids. It's the thing I, I wake up every morning and thank God for, mm. because I just can't bear the thought of how much worse things would be if we were desperately worried about our kids and grandkids, as well as about our parents and grandparents. Uh, so I think that's important because it means that we know who the vulnerable are already quite well. We also know the kind of comorbidities, the other conditions that increase the probability that people will be, will be killed by COVID-19. And that creates some opportunities. You can combine, I think, uh, a regime of social distancing that makes it very hard to imagine uh, any 
crowded event being possible in the near future. Uh, but it makes it possible to imagine manufacturing resuming, agriculture resuming, construction resuming. It's pretty hard to get COVID-19 outdoors. That's very clear from recent research. It's very easy to get it in a crowded subway. It's very easy to get it in a crowded uh, old folks home. There, there's a lot we now know about this virus that can help us craft a smart return, not to normalcy. We shouldn't probably even use that word because it's not going to be normal for a while but a return to economic activity that allows us to function as a society. Yes, I will be missing uh, going to uh, football and rugby. I'm still not quite over the fact that the Six Nations season never concluded, just as Scotland were rallying, uh, having beaten France. But hey, it's a small price uh, to pay for containing a pandemic that we have to give up on, on, on live sports for a while. Uh, but I think there's a lot that we don't need to give up on. And, and this is what I think every government needs to get its head around. What can you get back to doing and what, you should, uh, and what should you avoid doing? How can you protect the elderly and the vulnerable while allowing young people to get back uh, to work or to study? And, and those are solvable problems. That's why blanket lockdowns were and are a mistake and should as soon as possible be lifted. I think part of the Australian uh, success here relates to the fact that the Prime Minister chose wisely to listen to people who knew what they were talking about and who didn't. So, for example, uh, he declared a pandemic in Australia but well before the World Health Organisation did so and banned at some cost because he was accused of being racist and all sorts of things like that, flights from China very early on. Uh, and I think both of those factors reflect very well uh, on he and those around him who were advising him to take those courses of action. But it does raise the question again of China. You have, I think, courageously and insightfully uh, indicated that uh, there are many serious questions that need to be put before the Chinese. They should not be let off the hook on. Uh, and uh, uh, one of those uh, would be, I think, uh, uh, why it took them so long to admit when it, it must have been obvious for a lot longer that there was not only a problem, but that uh, this thing moved from human to human. Um, why was it that when they locked down flights in and out of Wuhan to other parts of China, they didn't lock down the international flights? Uh, what is the relationship between those various uh, uh, laboratories around the uh, the region that are quite close to the wet markets? Is there any linkage there? Has there been real transparency? Um, the danger here is that China, having been instrumental in, if not, if it's too simplistic perhaps to say they created the problem, certainly letting it get out of hand, they now want to be able to paint themselves as the heroes who are solving the problem for the globe. How do we hold them to real account? Yeah, that's a very important question in my view. I, I published an article three weeks ago asking six questions of, of Xi Jinping that I felt the Chinese government needed to answer. Needless to say, those questions have not yet been answered. Uh, though uh, we are, I think, getting a little bit more insight uh, into uh, the realities. Uh, it, for example, I think we now know that it probably wasn't a so-called wet market where uh, the, the virus first uh, crossed to humans, that it was more likely one of two laboratories in Wuhan engaged in research into zoonoses, uh, viruses or other pathogens that can cross from animals to people. And uh, a good article in the Washington Post a week or so ago uh, published some State Department uh, 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 wires that essentially uh, raised a flag about the safety uh, precautions being taken at one of those laboratories. It's important to stress that it's not being said uh, and wasn't being said by, by the State Department, Department officials who went to Wuhan that there was an engineered virus, uh, but simply that research into natural viruses was being done in a sloppy way. So that's 
a, a kind of partial answer to, to my first question. Second question hasn't really been answered. When did the central government know there was a serious problem? We know that the local officials in, in Wuhan and indeed provincial officials in Hubei did cover up the seriousness of the situation so that they could uh, keep the show on the road in, in Wuhan, including some very well-attended party functions, uh, and didn't uh, fess up. Uh, until the 20th or thereabouts of January, that they had a serious problem on their hands. We don't know how much the central government knew, uh, but my guess is they did know uh, well before January the 20th that there was a problem. Uh, and I do think we need more answers to, to questions about why it was that the Chinese government and the World Health Organization took so long to recognize and to acknowledge uh, publicly that there was a very serious epidemic of food uh, in that part of China. Uh, on the question of flights, it's a very murky question. I thought on the basis of records that I saw that flights had continued to fly from Wuhan to Western destinations after the, the ban uh, on flights on the 23rd. Uh, it looks, though it's not quite clear yet, as if uh, flights didn't go from Wuhan, although they were recorded as being from Wuhan. It's claimed that they now, it's now claimed that they went from Guangzhou rather than Wuhan. Uh, I wish I could say that the case was closed. I think that there's reason still to be a little suspicious. Uh, I have yet to see an authoritative account of what happened at Wuhan airport. Uh, in January, and I've yet to be entirely convinced that no flights left there after the 22nd. Uh, so that's still, I think, uh, case not closed. Um, and then, of course, th there are some bigger questions that uh, have only partly been answered. Uh, how many people actually died in China yeah. to date uh, of, of COVID-19? They just increased the number that they acknowledged had died in Hubei by 50%, rather too neatly by 50%, I think. Uh, so that, that, I think, is another file that's still uh, open, and I could go on. that The Chinese government has some serious answering to do to questions like these, if it's to have any credibility. Uh, and I think its attempt to bend the narrative and claim that actually it's the savior of humanity that's going to provide you with the tests and masks that you need is one of the most shameless bits of propaganda that I've seen since the end of the Cold War. In fact, it's a very disturbing feature of the last couple of months that the Chinese government has resorted to the kind of disinformation that we had previously associated with Russia. Uh, the New York Times just reported that uh, it was almost certainly Chinese agents who were responsible for trying to sow panic in the United States uh, with WhatsApp and other messages about an impending nationwide lockdown early in the crisis. I argued a year ago that we were already in Cold War II and it was time to stop beating about the bush. I, I think the pandemic has revealed that very clearly. Anybody who thought we'd be sort of joining forces against a common enemy has been sorely disappointed by the conduct of the Chinese government. And I find it frankly a scandal that a, a spokesman for the Chinese foreign ministry who tweeted conspiracy theories claiming that the virus in fact originated in the United States, this man is still in his job and that that surely reflects a great deal of bad faith on the Chinese side. Yeah I think uh, you finished that article uh, I think brilliantly you said China has a problem it is not the three body, body problem which reminds us that the Chinese people are capable of great literature just as Chinese researchers capable of great science. China's problem like Russia's before 1991 is the one party problem and so long as a fifth of humanity are subject to the will of an unaccountable, corrupt and power-hungry organisation with a long history of crimes against its own people, the rest of the world is also at risk. And, and that's a segue, I think, into the next point. We're so into self-loathing, you and I have talked about this uh, in the past, self-loathing in the West. We've so lost confidence in our own institutions. Um, uh, the, uh, the two, if you like, leaders of the free world, as I've uh, said, been tempted to see it for so long, uh, America and, uh, and Great Britain, as we talked about earlier, uh, are in even worse straits now as a result of this pandemic than they were perhaps six months ago in terms of uh, carrying their people uh, with a model for vitality in the future. 
um, we've got to be powerfully reminded, I think, of just how bad the alternatives are to our liberal Western democratic way of life. And uh, I think in this great rush, particularly in this country, to say ideology's dead, you've got a conservative government, uh, it's found money to respond to this crisis on a non-ideological basis. We need to be careful that we don't lose sight of a proper framework and a proper set of principles, even values, to keep in mind as we try to work back out of this into some degree uh, of uh, a satisfactory place again in the future. Uh, because what we're doing at the moment to our economies and indeed the way in which we've been prepared to restrict our freedoms in pursuit of safety is very risky, I think, Neil, and exposes us to great dangers going forward. And I'd love to unpack that a bit. Well, John, I think that the challenge uh, is going to be this, that uh, we're, we're leading people to expect a single curve that we have to flatten through sacrifice now. And we're telling them that uh, the, the sacrifice in terms of economic lockdowns is going to be compensated uh, with what amounts to universal basic income uh, and modern monetary theory. Nobody's using those terms, but if you look closely at the monetary and fiscal policies being adopted in the US and the UK, that's pretty much what's happening. And there's a couple of big problems. The first is that this isn't going to be one curve that we flatten. It's going to be multiple waves. That's nearly always the case with pandemics. And I don't think people are psychologically ready uh, for a second wave, uh, potentially in the summer or probably more likely in October uh, when the weather uh, cools in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, and and that, that's, that's very problematic for the, the fiscal and monetary policy because how, how can you really extend the kind of measures that we've seen enacted in the last weeks uh, uh, through this year and into next year when we've already roughly tripled, tripled the federal deficit in relation to GDP from it was close to 5% going into the pandemic. It's now going to be something like 15%. Uh, we've got the federal debt on a trajectory to exceed in relation to GDP its World War II peak. And, uh, and, and that's on the basis of measures that have been enacted in a matter of weeks, uh, numbered uh, in, in trillions. Uh, this can't continue. It's creating a completely unsustainable uh, fiscal position. Uh, and I worry very much about uh, what happens when... Uh, say a year from now, uh, we're attempting to get uh, back to some kind of normalcy. Let's be optimistic and imagine that there's a vaccine in place by then. And we look around us and we find uh, an enormous debt uh, accumulation, larger than that which we saw after the global financial crisis, and the abandonment of any rules whatever with respect to monetary policy so that, in effect, uh, the Federal Reserve and the Bank of England have, uh, have resorted to monetary financing of government as if we were at war. Uh, and, and there are theories in place, they've already been popular on the left for some time, theories about universal basic income, that the government should just pay people uh, regardless of whether they work or not, and theories of, of, of modern monetary theory that say there's really no reason why there shouldn't be monetary financing of government. Uh, and as an historian, I can only say uh, that way lies perdition because it, it's not conceivable to me that there is a, a smooth passage out of policies like these. It's possible that you could end up with an inflationary outcome, especially since we're seeing not only unemployment benefits going up to very high levels, uh, but also minimum wages uh, likely to rise too. There's going to be some, I think, inflationary risk from, from that, as well as, of course, from the massive expansion of the Federal Reserve balance sheet. But, but if not an inflation risk, and I think in the short run, that's highly unlikely. I think if there's any inflation risk, in the developed world, it's a problem for 2021 or 2022. If that's not the scenario, then there's going to be a scenario of a fiscal crunch because there will be nasty fiscal arithmetic with debt levels uh, this high, even if central banks essentially like 
the Bank of Japan become responsible for fixing interest rates at unprecedentedly low levels in order to keep debt service down. Uh, it's, it's very interesting to look at the Japanese experience because I think we're going to find ourselves in that situation in the US uh, and in Europe very soon with a very high level of debt to GDP and a very difficult uh, balancing act to strike uh, with monetary and fiscal policy, uh, essentially trying to achieve growth uh, and consistently failing to do so. Uh, that, that's, I think, the, the most likely scenario that we essentially are turning Japanese in terms of fiscal and monetary policy. I was just in Japan late last year, and it seems like a, a kind of viable future in the sense that Japan's a stable place. Uh, it's so far handled the pandemic uh, remarkably well, but it's also a place w- which feels uh, like slow growth has become institutionalized. As if, as if it's almost a stationary state. And when you look at the numbers, you can see why with this extraordinary debt burden and, and a monetary policy that is essentially a form of debt management. They call it yield curve control, but it's basically debt management. So I think that's probably where we're heading. And I don't think that's a particularly enticing prospect for societies that are much less homogenous than Japan's. Uh, try doing this in the multicultural, deeply divided America of 2020, and I don't see it working nearly as well. So those are the scenarios that, that worry me. Uh, I think the, the, the short-term expedients kind of dominate uh, when you're staring at uh, 17 million, maybe 22 million lost jobs, when you're staring at a, an economy that's essentially ground to a halt, when you're staring at a bigger supply shock than there has been, when you're looking at a GDP contraction bigger than anything since the 1930s, sure, it's pretty tempting to say we'll do whatever it takes, but we should be under no illusions uh, that there will be consequences, unintended consequences of these policies. And as I say, say if, if we'd only taken a rational approach to the pandemic and avoided the, the lockdowns to begin with, we wouldn't have needed to do uh, half of this. In a sense, of course, we went into the lockdowns and into this massive attempt to uh, feed the bear while it's in hibernation from a position of enormous economic weakness already because the, the great financial crisis saw basically a doubling of virtually every Western country's debt to GDP ratios from worrying levels to quite frightening levels and nothing was done about it. If I can divert for a moment, and I'm not wanting to sound uh, too uh, boastfully Australian, I think it's been interesting to watch what's happened here. We had reforming governments of both political persuasions, if you like, between the early 80s and about 2005, seven, when productivity was improved, real living standards rose, the Treasury was awash because of economic growth and the taxation revenues that flowed. So it's not true as, uh, as liberals, as you would call them sometimes in uh, your country, uh, uh, progressives, they might call themselves here, would say, oh, it was all because China kept buying uh, Australian minerals. In fact, if you look at the prices we were receiving for them, they weren't exceptionally high during a lot of the years when Australia was doing very well economically. But uh, I was part of a government. In fact, I was one of the five asked by Howard Uh, in 1996 to end the deficits and pay down the debt. We went into the GFC with money in the bank, no debt. Uh, And uh, we got to a point before the pandemic where the government was looking at another surplus, the first for many, many years, but debt was up to 20% of GDP. We'll come out of this with it being more like 45, 50, even 55% of GDP. That's a massive rise. But my point is, in a way, we've been able to stand on the shoulders of government that did some pretty, governments, I don't want to be exclusive about it, did some pretty tough and, at the time, unpopular reform work. But inherent in what you've been saying, and I think I've been reflecting, is a sort of a dull resignation to the idea that there probably isn't the willpower and the courage and the determination to tackle the sort of reforms that are going to be needed if we're going to wind our way out of this mess. We seem to be unable to cope with the idea of cleaning up a mess anymore. And I find that really disturbing because this won't be the last shock, whether it's a pandemic next time or something else that triggers another economic shock. Surely we require the 
discipline and the focus in Western democratic nations and the leadership to say that we can't keep on ratcheting ourselves down forever. Somewhere, sometime, we've got to engage in some real reform. We've got to look again at productivity. We've got to look at how tax systems are structured. We've got to look at how we start to wind back public sector exposure. I agree with that. I think one of the worst uh, tendencies that, that we've seen in the last 10 years has been that, that conservatives uh, in, in Britain and in, in the United States have made common cause with populists who essentially jettisoned uh, fiscal responsibility from uh, the conservative uh, menu. And uh, that was as true of, uh, of, of Donald Trump as it was of Boris Johnson uh, and I, I, I do regret that because I think it's, it's an inescapable reality that unless you uh, use the good times uh, to uh, stabilize uh, public finances, there will be no uh, way of coping with the bad times. And reckless fiscal policy has been, I'm afraid, a signature of the Trump administration going right back to a very ill-advised uh, tax-cutting bill uh, in 2017. Uh, as I said, the deficit was already on track to be 4.5% of GDP at a time of full employment uh, before the pandemic struck. Uh, if, if you can get to full employment only through that kind of, uh, of fiscal uh, stimulus, combined, of course, with uh, Federal Reserve policy that, that had essentially blinked, wimped out of normalizing rates and ending quantitative easing, uh, then it's not a healthy uh, growth. It's not a, a healthy prosperity. It, it's a prosperity based on steroids. And I think the US economy has been like one of these athletes that one used to see in the bad old days before there was rigorous testing, uh, so full of steroids that any gold medals uh, really need to be handed back. Uh, it's going to be a very long road back uh, to any kind of fiscal responsibility in the U.S. Some of us have been talking about this for so long that we're kind of almost hoarse with the effort. Uh, but it doesn't stop being true uh, just because nobody's heeded uh, these warnings for the better part of 20 years. And it's been 20 years since the U.S. was anywhere close to fiscal surplus. Uh, so I think there's going to be some painful adjustment, not just uh, by governments, but by uh, the conservative parties uh, of the Northern Hemisphere. Germany, of course, uh, remained fiscally frugal and uh, uh, had rules in place, a break in place to prevent there being a, a deficit. And it puts Angela Merkel in a stronger position uh, today to say we need to do uh, exceptional things at the European level to help uh, Italy out of the hole that it's in. Uh, so there are some exceptions to the rule, but I do, I do look at the United States and, and say uh, to myself, uh, we have frittered away the opportunities to set the house in order. And it's a, it's a shocking reflection on American conservatism, but that's the case. And I, I do struggle to imagine how we, how we get back to any kind of fiscal responsibility. Uh, the conservative movement has sort of blown it and, and won't be able uh, to say anything with any credibility on this subject should we end up with a democratic administration after, after November. Um, I'm afraid that uh, this, this is a very fundamental weakness of American conservatism there. Just perhaps we've had some shocking insights into what really serious economic collapses do uh, to people's uh, lifestyles, their job opportunities, and all of those sorts of things. I mean, you've had the coronavirus as one example. We can now, if we're honest, see the one-party state is hardly something we want to live under. Just perhaps to the obsession with climate change, I'm not saying it's not important, but I am saying the one-track mind that had everybody so focused on it that they missed this train coming at us will sober us up a little bit and make us determined to rethink our own freedoms, rethink our own... Uh, uh, prosperity and uh, the desirability of being able to afford things and to uh, think of our own children. It seems to me, though, that until we are willing to, to, to pull together and focus on our common interests and stop dividing over everything that divides us in the West, in our cultures, 
it's almost impossible to hope to find the sort of leaders, uh, you know, the good, strong people who can, uh, with high intelligence and with deep knowledge uh, and with deep courage, take us forward. We, we, we have to be worthy of them, if I can put it that way. There's a, in other words, we're being held back economically uh, by what we've allowed ourselves to become socially. Well, I think there's a very important lesson to be learned from this pandemic, uh, and, it, and it's not the one that the left wants us to learn, because the progressives uh, uh, here in the United States want to say, you see, this proves the case for big, big government. It proves the case uh, for some kind of uh, socialist uh, healthcare system, and, and, and it really doesn't do that at all. Actually, uh, what the pandemic has revealed is just how utterly defective big government is because we had big government set up to deal with pandemics as i mentioned earlier with its panoply of legislation uh, task forces uh, powerpoint decks and 36 page reports and it it failed uh, it was the small nimble government of taiwan that that excelled uh, the other good performers interestingly in this crisis have included israel uh, smallish states used to having very few friends in the international community have outperformed the big lumbering states uh, that uh, that I, I've talked about in our in our conversation. So lesson number one, you need small, technologically enabled, smart government to contend with problems like pandemics and climate change. I like, I like you, John. I'm not saying climate change isn't an issue. It clearly is. And we're going to need to confront its, uh, its challenges with equal smartness. Because if we're as stupid about climate change as we've been about a pandemic, then we're going to crater our economy all over again the next time there are severe fires uh, or, or floods in some other part of, of, of the world. Um, so I, I think that's a really important uh, insight that the pandemic has, has given us. And I hope that we'll, we'll sit down and learn the right lessons from this, because I do see a future uh, for a slimmed down, uh, lighter, smarter kind of government uh, dealing with problems uh, of the sort that we're discussing in the way that I, I saw the Taiwanese doing. But there are some terrific things to be learned from that China uh, and some terrible uh, wrong things to be learned from its giant uh, one-party dominated neighbour. But I, I do think that, that for the Australian government uh, as well as for the British and American governments, it's, it's important to see the need to reinvent the public sector in the 21st century, so that it, it isn't the incompetent, failing, bureaucratic, big government that I'm afraid we've seen on display in, in both Britain and the United States. There are lots of countries that are getting this right. I could also have mentioned Estonia, one of the first countries to really be tech savvy about, about government. Uh, and I'm, I'm hoping that, that this is an opportunity for us to take a long, hard look in the mirror and say, what has really not worked in our in our public sector? What what did we get wrong here, and how can we fix it? There is, I think, therefore, some basis for a new uh, individualistic, freedom-minded, uh, but technologically enabled democracy. I want to stress this because it's very important. We have to use technology in a whole variety of ways to ensure that our societies are safe, safe in this case from a contagious disease. We cannot let that lead to a big brother kind of surveillance state of the sort that they have in China. And what we can learn from a country like Taiwan is how you combine tech savviness with individual freedom and privacy. Uh, they really have done a good job there by bringing into the government uh, some of the kind of hacker libertarians that uh, are very much on the periphery of, of government in the United States. So yeah, I, I think there's some exciting possibilities uh, if we only know where to look for them. Uh, and the place to look for them is not Beijing. The place to look for them is actually Taipei. That's a very fascinating set of insights. Uh, uh, and. It's probably a truism of human nature that, that we've been prepared to give up some freedoms very quickly in terms of this lockdown out of concern and fear about our own well-being. Uh, fleeing for security 
and giving up some freedom when you don't feel safe is understandable. But we don't want to stay there. We have to move back to a commitment to freedom if we're to be worthy of, of either, I think. Um, but uh, can I just then conclude on something else that I think is very important? We need to be really careful not to overreact with the questions that are now being asked about globalisation. Uh, you know, free trade has lifted countless millions of people out of poverty around the world or freer trade. Uh, on the other hand, we have to have secure supply lines. I'm an Australian farmer. Uh, we produce a great deal of food for other people. Uh, the ratio is about one farmer for 600 people who eat, which, in, in, which is quite extraordinary, I think. Um, uh, but uh, we can't do that without imported uh, uh, feedstock. Uh, we're dependent on imported oil, we're import, uh, certain chemical ingredients, certain machinery parts we can't produce here anymore or don't produce, uh, a lot of our fertilisers, these sorts of things. So we've got to avoid extremes and overreactions as we hear calls for the re-establishment of manufacturing, the re-emergence of protectionism and so forth seems for me to be a real danger on the one hand, on the other hand, obviously you can't have a situation where America's dependent for 90% of its pharmaceuticals on Japan, Australia 80%. Getting that balance right, I think, will be very, very important for prosperity and for safety going forward. On China, not, not Japan, John, I, I'm sure you, you meant to say dependent on, on China because I wouldn't be at all bothered if I... Uh, uh, we're heavily reliant on, on Japan, a, a democracy with very high standards of governance. Look, I, I think that uh, one of the most important uh, developments, uh, really, of the last four years has been a, a fundamental shift in American attitudes towards China. Uh, successive administrations essentially accommodated China's rise, acquiesced in its bending uh, of the rules of the World Trade Organization, and uh, for all his many flaws, Donald Trump uh, cold time on that and change the strategic direction of the United States. Uh, I'm a free trader. Uh, and uh, like you, I believe that there are enormous gains uh, to be had on all sides from a liberal international trading order. But we can't have the second largest economy in the world systematically breaking the rules and getting away with it. Uh, and that's really the, the, the situation that we've been in ever since China joined the WTO back in 2001. I think that the, a critical issue uh, that needs to be addressed in the wake of the pandemic is how far China is willing to play by the rules and how far we are prepared to trust it to do so. And after so many years, not just of intellectual property theft, but of systematic uh, cheating on subsidies to state-owned enterprises, the pursuit of, of a policy that is essentially one of self-sufficiency in semiconductors at the expense of, uh, of fair competition, all of that seems to me uh, still to be unresolved. And, and in a way, the pandemic got the Chinese off the hook because they just committed to a very limited phase one deal uh, with the United States. Um, now they haven't had to execute, they haven't had to deliver on that. Uh, so I think there's a lot of unfinished business to do on trade. There's a lot of unfinished business to do on a variety of other issues. Uh, one of those national champions that the Chinese have been subsidizing is Huawei. Uh, and Huawei was poised to become almost the uh, sole player, certainly the dominant player in 5G technology networks around the world. I'm glad to say that the pandemic has led at least one government, the British government, to rethink relying on, on Huawei. So I think there's a way forward uh, which doesn't lead us to the 1930s, doesn't lead us to a world of autarky and uh, extraordinarily high tariffs. Uh, there's a way forward, I think, also to uh, a meaningful free trade regime uh, for digital services. But there will have to be standards there that, that protect individuals from having their data exploited uh, by one party states and the companies that operate within those states. So I'm not entirely uh, uh, despairing. I, I think that we can fight for a, a liberal international order in trade, not only in goods, but also in, in services. But we will have to fight. It's not going to happen by itself, and it's certainly not going to happen if we simply take uh, China's uh, words at, at face value, because they've made many protestations of uh, of good faith on intellectual property and on other fronts, uh, but those have not been met by 
by actions, not been matched by actions any more than their their fine words about climate change have been matched by actions. They they ramp up coal consumption right now as part of their effort to get back. Uh, to economic normalcy. So I think in the wake of this crisis, it's not just the questions that I asked Xi Jinping that need to be answered. There's a whole range of questions that China needs to answer. And if it's not prepared to give honest answers and make meaningful commitments to a a free trade order, then we will simply have to conclude uh, that it should leave the World Trade Organization or we should create a new organization of countries that are sincerely committed to economic freedom. That's my feeling. Well, Neil, thank you so much. Uh, The years of deep study and commitment to sound public policy that have been your life, I think have never been needed more than they are now. So I hope that you are widely appreciated and listened to in these very uncertain times, lest we end up failing to craft a secure future for our children and our grandchildren. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you, John. A pleasure to talk to you as always. Thank you for watching this episode. We appreciate your support. If you value vital conversations like this one, be sure to subscribe to the channel there and also click the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases.